the next paper that I want to go through is a technical one. These are usually useful, these normalizations, when you go and sit behind your computer and you have a good idea, it's a good mathematical idea, you take it to the computer and it's not gonna work. And it's usually these types of details that are really important that are gonna help your algorithm converge or the training process succeed. We used layer normalization when we were doing uh, the attention and transformer models, uh, but actually layer normalizations are introduced for recurrent neural networks. And let's go through that and see why you cannot do batch normalization when you're doing uh, recurrent neural networks. So let's just start with batch normalization. I'm gonna go through a very simple neural network. It's actually a neuron of a neural network. And uh, let's introduce some notations. Let's say AL is a vector representation. So AL is first of all a vector. It's a representation of some of some inputs to the neuron in layer L. And I'm gonna tell you what it is, why we call it some inputs. So L is for the layer, A is a vector. Each entry of that vector is uh, gonna be summed because there is gonna be some dot product here. And that product is gonna give you some summation of some weights times, times the input to that layer. So this is a vector, this is a scalar, HL is also a vector. And these WILs are coming from your weight matrix. I don't know, these are rows of your weight matrix. And uh, these are basically the connections. These are the incoming weights to the ith hidden unit. So I is gonna be the ith hidden unit. L is gonna be the layer that you're currently at. W I L is a vector, and it's gonna have the same size as your input. So H is your bottom up input, is the result of the previous layer. And then not only you do some multiplications, some weight multiplications, you are gonna add a bias term to each single hidden unit. And then you push it through a nonlinearity that's gonna give you the output of your neural network. So that's a very simple one. It's fully connected. And then that's gonna give you L plus one. Now you're ready for the next layer. So this is gonna be your new L and then you keep doing the same thing. And then we are gonna do batch normalization. Without batch normalization, many of these uh, deep neural networks are not gonna converge. And the reason is uh, internal covariate shift because once your parameters change, the statistics of the inputs, the statistics of these guys are gonna change. Once you optimize during your training, as you optimize these guys, as you update them, the statistics of uh, these summed inputs are gonna change. Their mean and a standard deviation are gonna change. And then somehow, and sometimes they're gonna fall in the regime where your activation function is gonna saturate or kill those activities. So normalization is very important to make your method stabilize. So what are you gonna do? Each one of these activities, they are gonna depend on the batch that are going in. They're gonna depend on your data. So let's take a mini batch, push it through your neural network, and then that's gonna give you a bunch of numbers. You can take the average of those numbers. So this averaging is with respect to your data. It is not with respect to I, it is not with respect to L. So it is with respect to your batch. And the bigger your batch, the more accurate this statistic is gonna be, okay? That's gonna give you a mean. This is gonna give you a standard deviation. Again, this is a standard deviation with respect to the data, not I and L. So you compute those two statistics and then you normalize your AI. You normalize your summed inputs. You subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation, but then if you do that, and if you forget about this coefficient here, this term is always gonna have a mean zero and a standard deviation of one. So there is not gonna be much learning going on because the scale of these, param these activities is always gonna be one. So not much learning is gonna go on. You're always normalizing. To counter that effect, you're gonna introduce some new parameters. So these parameters you're gonna learn, these are the scaling parameters, these are learnable, mu and sigma, they are computing. So you're computing them. And uh, this bias term is also learnable. That's batch normalization. And GIL, you can call it the gain parameter. So what is layer normalization then? 
first of all, uh, what is the problem with this method? If the batch size is very small, and sometimes it has to be very small whenever you are working with videos or whenever you are working with uh, large language models like transformers, they are going to consume a lot of memory. So you are bound to make your batches, batch sizes small for your model to fit, to fit on your GPU. Otherwise, you're going to get uh, memory errors. So your batch sometimes has to be small. And if it is a small, these statistics are really bad. So it would be good to have a normalization framework that doesn't depend on the batch size, that is capable of working with batch sizes of one. So what is the difference now? Rather than computing your mean using your the statistics of or, or the distribution of your data or your mini batch, you're gonna compute your mean by averaging over the entries of your vector, over the elements. So now your summation is over the elements, it's not over the data. And each one of these A's, as I mentioned, they are vectors and they're gonna have, they're gonna be in H dimensional. They're gonna be in RH. You compute your statistic based on your elements, based on the elements of your vector. Same thing for your standard deviation. So you're doing it based on I. And as, I see, as you see these numbers, they don't depend on I anymore, okay? Previously they did, like mu I, sigma I. And H is the number of hidden units in a layer, the dimension. What happens? Different training cases, different data is gonna have its own independent normalization term. So every single data, so this, is, this statistic is gonna be data dependent. For instance, if an image goes in, this is gonna be dependent on that particular image. If uh, a text goes in, that's gonna be the statistics of that text, et cetera, or that particular sentence. And you have no constraint on the size of a mini batch. Now your mini batch could be as big as you want or as small as you want, as small as one. Why is this useful? They're particularly useful for recurrent neural networks. And can somebody think of a reason why recurrent neural networks? Why do we do recurrent neural networks in the first place? What happens to our data? What type of data do we have? Sequential data? Yes, so you have sequential data and each sentence can have its own length, okay? And we know that recurrent neural networks, their depth, they are gonna be deep in time and their depth depends on the sequence length. Maybe the first few layers of your neural network, your recurrent neural network, you're fine. You can compute these statistics based on the data, but then the last layers, sometimes they disappear because one sentence was shorter than the other sentence. And uh, so these statistics are gonna be less and less accurate as you go deeper in your network. Why? Because they depend on the data and the data, they have their own length and, uh, and a recurrent neural network is as deep in time as the depth of your, as the number of elements in your sequence. So does that make sense? Okay, perfect. And that's the reason different sequence length is for different training cases. Basically you have different depths for different training cases. Even if you pad them with zeros, then your statistics are gonna be not accurate. It's just a bunch of zeros being pushed through your network, okay? These statistics, the deeper you go, so L, is now gonna be your data dependent. So the deeper you go, you have less of these data to work with. Most of them are gonna be zero if you are doing zero padding or uh, they don't just exist. So these statistics are not gonna be accurate. So how do we do layer normalization for a recurrent neural network then? You have your current input at time t, you have your previous input, these are your hidden states. These two are vectors. For a recurrent neural network, the simplest version without any fancy activation, so no LSTM, no GRU, you take the previous hidden state, multiply it by a matrix. You take the current input, multiply it by a matrix. They're now they're gonna have the same dimension after multiplication, and then you add them up. So now your summed input is gonna be different from what you had before, slightly different. What are we gonna do? We are gonna compute the mean and the standard deviation and then subtract it element-wise from these vectors. The mean is gonna be done over the dimension of these vectors. The standard deviation, the summation is over the dimension of these vectors. And these are batch independent. And each data is gonna have its own mean and a standard deviation. You can have batch size of one to work with. 
And layer normalization is particularly useful for sequence models, and it's much less useful when you're doing images. So for images, people still use batch normalization. For recurrent neural networks and language models, transformers, you see layer normalization. So let's see some invariances for batch norm, weight norm, and layer norm. Weight norm is another technique for, normaliz for normalization. That one is also batch independent. You can work with batches of batch sizes of one. What happens is that whenever you have a matrix or whenever you have a vector of weights, you're gonna divide it by the norm of that vector. So if this is a vector, you're gonna divide it by the norm of that vector and that's gonna normalize your weights. So batch normalization, weight normalization, layer normalization. They are all invariant to rescaling your matrix, your weight matrix. If you take this matrix, actually this matrix here, multiplied by a scalar, then what's gonna happen is that these mean and standard deviation that you're computing, they're gonna scale by the same number, by the same scale, and so they're gonna just cancel out when you do your subtract and subtraction and division, because this has the same scale, this has the same scale. There is a parameter, for instance, alpha coming out, and then sigma is a scale by some scale alpha, alpha and alpha are gonna cancel out. So they're gonna be invariant to weights, and you're gonna have some more invariances. Like if you recenter your weights, these two are not invariant to weight recentering. This is invariant. Recentering is just your uh, subtracting a bias from your weight. So you're subtracting a scalar from your weights. Each vector you can rescale. Each one of these guys you can rescale. The previous one you were rescaling the entire matrix. Now you can rescale each one, each one of your rows independently. Batch norm, weight norm are invariant. Layer norm is not. If you rescale your data, multiply it by make your data bigger. Batch norm is invariant, layer norm is invariant, and weight norm is not. And this is actually one of the reasons why normalization works, because now you can, the scale of your data doesn't really matter. If you recenter your data, shift it to the left or right, batch norm is invariant, these two are not, so you have to be careful. You cannot shift your data. And then single training case rescaling. If you take a single training case and rescale it, Layer norm is going to be invariant. Those two are not going to be. Why am I including this paper here? Because the main application that they have in the paper is for pairs of images and text. So that's multimodal. You can have image sentence ranking. This is the retrieval task. You can have question answering, contextual language modeling, generative modeling, handwriting, sequence generation, and MNIST classification. So you get the worst performance on MNIST because these are images. So layer norm doesn't work that good for images. For the retrieval task, adding the layer norm, this is a technique that we are not covering in this paper, in this class, but let's assume you have that technique. You can plug in layer norm, and then that's gonna make your network train much faster. Same thing here. We can have different measures. Recall at one, recall at five, recall at 10. And these are coming from images and sentences. This is a retrieval task. Uh, these are coming from the Microsoft Cocoa data. So if you want to explore this, that's a good data set to explore. You can apply it to another for reading comprehension. So that's LSDM without any normalization. That's how much time it's gonna take you to train. This is your validation error. If you add batch norm, that's what's going to happen if you add batch norm everywhere, not only to your LSTM, but if you have any fully connected network, et cetera, that's going to give you that result. And layer norm is going to give you the best. And you're doing it only on your LSTMs. Okay, any questions before I move on to the next topic?